eyes may be able to see, but without a heart, you cannot feel. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Will Come Show, episode 67. This is your host, George C.S.C. Samuels, and today we're going to be talking about healthcare, transparency, and communities in terms of support networks during COVID-19. So let's get straight into the episode. All right, so here we are. So I've got a few articles today, and you know we're, we're talking about health and this is not often a, a subject area that I would usually cover, but I do see, especially at this time, uh, the, the correlations between you know health, um, the, the blockchain space, right, Bitcoin, and even uh, communities in general, right? So those other two, the two last ones are uh, passion areas of mine, but you know, especially now, everything is connected. And I think that's what this current epidemic virus, uh, coronavirus has really shown us is that we can't continue to just think that something that happens over in you know china or some other part of the world it doesn't affect us anymore right and i think that's one of the the big lessons to take from uh, what's happening right now and so uh, with that this post here was shared by someone who is working in the healthcare field and um I was really grateful for this article being shared, but can we reimagine global health in the post-pandemic world, right? And so if we look at here, all right, I'm gonna highlight this. Uh, the positive fallout, the pandemic has made global health easier because we don't have to show the world is interlinked. As I was just saying, even a school child today knows what happens in Wuhan can profoundly affect the health of New York City. Everyone in the world now understands that their health and sheer life can be put at risk by things far on the other side of the world. Uh, health interdependence, uh, yeah, etc. And just taking a look at this, right? We don't have to make a case for investing in health, right? So here, I mean, on, on the whole, this it, it just becomes very interesting, right? Because uh, things like healthcare have, haven't. We know there's been issues around the entire system of healthcare, right? And we're seeing that being. Uh, being magnified even more so during this crisis. And we're seeing which countries have been able to um, handle things in terms of healthcare better than others. And so probably in the future, we'll, we'll revisit this because, you know, even folks like Bill Gates has uh, been talking a lot about, uh, you know, essentially us not being prepared for a pandemic. Um, there was a famous TED talk that he had, um, which let me have a look here, actually healthcare, Bill Gates, TED talk. Right. This this is an article I'll share it in the comments uh, or in the notes, the show notes afterwards. But uh, yeah, Bill Gates, the next outbreak, we're not ready. This was five years ago, all right, uh, 2015. And so it's really interesting to see how things have, have come after just, you know, five years, right? So coronavirus makes clear what has been true all along. Your health is as safe as that of the worst insured, worst cared for person in your society. It will be decided by the height of the floor, not the ceiling. I mean, this is really interesting. And, you know, right here, public health has never been a sexy field, right? But after COVID-19, we might not need to sell public health anymore. And it, it just goes to show that, you know, there's also been talks as well about how at this point in time, uh, all the bullshit, bullshit jobs are essentially being brought up for review and sort of maybe even cast aside. There are a lot of people who have made their livings on what they call bullshit jobs. And that's not to say that what you have to share with the world isn't of value. It's just that there are jobs, obviously, for peace times and jobs for war times. And right now, we're kind of going into a wartime period. In and even though we're not really at war with any nation or alien invading alien army, um, we are at war with uh, something that is invisible, you know, and uh, we have no idea how to approach it. And it's going to take time. And, you know, it's really fascinating to see all of us just sort of going into our caves, really. Um, that's what we're being asked to do. And so with this, uh, again, I, I will I will share this article with everybody for, so you can have a read. Um, but will the pandemic help reverse colonial trends? Before the pandemic and currently every aspect of global health was dominated by exports, experts and institutions in high-income countries. Will this change after the pandemic? Historically, LMICs have always dealt with epidemics and HICs, uh, which are high-income countries, uh, LM, uh, oh yeah, high income countries have been the saviors. With the COVID 19 pandemic, LMICs seem to be handling things better than HICs. Um, now, LMICs, because I'm not a 
uh, I'm not a healthcare expert. LMICs, okay. Middle income countries, low and middle income countries. All right, that makes sense, right? And so, yeah, I think this is probably playing, uh, leveling the playing field a bit when it comes to healthcare because there'll be probably expertise, findings, research coming out from countries you just would not expect before. So I think, I think that's a great thing, uh, to be honest. Uh, so time for a stronger World Health, World Health Organization? Yeah, definitely uh, think so. You know, it, if you feel a certain way about the WHO at this point in time, feel free to put it in the comments below. Um, there's definitely a lot of conspiracy theories going out about WHO uh, being funded by the Rothschilds, etc. Um, but yeah, again, won't go into too much of that. Uh, the negative fallout. Routine immunization. Ah, yes. So I've been hearing this on Twitter as well, where people are worried about getting vaccines that have been untested. Um, I know there are trials taking place already, and it's quite weird. Like some of the uh, news was about like testing, you know, these vaccines on uh, LMICs, right? The lower middle income uh, in income countries, uh, because what they're more expendable. I mean, yeah. Kind of, kind of, kind of messed up. Kind of weird. But uh, yeah, here we got as well. Economies worldwide will be substantially weakened, so the evolution of low-income to middle-income country status will slow down or reverse. I'm looking right here, right? Um, and even while more is needed, broader development assistance will be at risk. So again, you know, this is just uh, tying into like the whole sort of uh, supply chain right now is also being stress test, uh, stress tested. And I mean, this article is is very extensive. And I actually really enjoyed reading it. But, you know, let's keep to the, the main quotes. COVID-19 has taught us that health is the basis of wealth, that global health is no longer defined by Western nations and must also be guided by Africa and Asia, and that international solidarity is an essential response and a superior approach to isolationism. We may emerge from this with a healthier respect for the environment and our common humanity. And I think this is what appealed the most, right? Um, it's using health. And, you know, what it says here, health is the basis of wealth. I mean, no truer words could be could be said. And, you know, I think even I'm guilty of this when it comes to health. Uh, often, you know, when you work when you, when you work a lot, you often neglect your health, right? Um, and there always seems to be uh, some tension there. But, you know, even many successful people, many wealthy people, at the end of the day, right, when they say, okay, work hard, but then if it comes at the expense of their health, um, it's all for naught. Uh, you know, I think even Steve Jobs, right, in, the, in his final days, uh, when he was going through his uh, treatments and, you know, looking at like what's most important, you know, it's not necessarily all the things that, all, all the money, right? It's like loved ones. Uh, what are you leaving as a lasting legacy, etc. And so this is a good time for everybody to check their, their health and to also question, you know, what we've been used to, uh, which talked about in previous episodes about the popping pill culture. You know, when things happen, when you're sick, rest. Do not try to overload yourself or just keep going without acknowledging all right so uh yeah thanks again uh, for for that article here be on the lookout for covid 19's hidden cost to older people okay so this has to do with isolationism so we talked about that um in the article so this article here be on the lookout for this is for the elderly right you know right now the elderly are at uh, the highest risk um due to covid 19 and so we've got uh, this article here just outlining uh the the risk for when it comes to loneliness and isolationism. Um, and it's, it's sad because actually I know a few people whose uh, grandparents were actually, uh, who actually died you know, at a hospital due to COVID-19 and uh, they couldn't even go see the grandparents. And the grandparents were, were alone you know, with strangers um, in their final hours. I mean, how tragic is that? And unfortunately, that's one of the other side effects of what's going on right now even though even though i talk a lot about the the opportunities that present themselves during this time doesn't mean that uh, i am, am not feeling for all of all of this right so with the um the physical issues right that that come with covid 19 the side effects are uh, mental and emotional for a lot of people right mental health you know dealing with like being alone at home uh being isolated from friends and family it's going to really test people's m resilience and I think it's really important for, we're lucky we have the internet, that we're not completely shut off from the wider community, the wider society, right? At least we have technology, you're watching this, that we can actually um, do things together socially to keep ourselves going. Um, it's just the physical aspect that we're, we, we, we want to have. And so um, you can see here, uh, let's have a look. 
Loneliness is dangerous, sometimes even more so than obesity, according to research presented at the American Psychological Association in 2017. I'm looking here. Um, people who had greater social connections had a 50% reduced risk of dying early than those who didn't. Right, And this is a case for uh, communities, and why I keep talking about communities, because in a society where we're so, um, it's very consumerist, right? It's very individualistic because that's the influence of the West. Uh, it is really important that you have strong social bonds, right? Connect, being connected to others is one thing, but being able to connect more deeply, I mean, that's, that's the next phase in which we were kind of going into already, especially when we're talking about communities online, etc. And so, yeah, as you can see, right, the greater your social connections, uh, the reduced risk of dying early, right? Because loneliness kills, literally. I mean, it can. So social isolation, loneliness, and living alone played a significant role in premature death. Another set of 70 studies representing 3.4 million people in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia found, right? So this is something to be really aware of, right? Um, please don't forget to, you know, call your loved ones, call family, call friends during this time. It's a great time to, to really focus on what matters. So do that. Okay. Uh, next article. All right. Coronavirus, surviving the looming mental health crisis. So this was actually shared, um, in our pack group. So just putting this up again for those of you who are new to the show. So there is, uh, we have a, a productivity accelerator and community called the pack. Uh, we meet uh, pretty much uh, every week online, uh, but also daily and monthly. Uh, daily, we do these things called a daily scrum, and uh, it's all about productivity. But at the same time, we deal with you know things around mental health and uh, physical fitness, uh, all the things when it comes to goal setting and uh, being able to achieve what you set out to do. But uh, you know this was built about four to five years ago as it was well, and uh, it was actually built to deal with loneliness during job hunting. Right. So again, all related, all connected. So the looming mental health crisis. Right. There's a lot of people right now. Um, yeah. Who are who are dealing with who might have already been dealing with, you know, mental health issues. And so this might be exaggerated. Um, sorry, not exaggerated, magnified um, during this time. So, again, it's just about reaching out to people, you know, um, don't be afraid to. And uh, yeah, routine. Right. One, from today until this is over, you have a new God and his name is Routine. This is definitely what I would say is going to be what saves you during this time. And, you know, I just showed you the pack. The pack is all about routine and discipline. And, you know, uh, depending on your reaction to the name Wolf, right? Uh, one of the reasons why we use it as a symbol for our community is because uh, it has been so useful during this time, right? Even though the world is going a bit nuts and crazy, um, because of our own routines and discipline in this group, uh, it's really been a bit of a lifesaver, right? Because we know that despite what's happening in the outside world, we, we go within, we do our routines, and um, that is what helps provide the focus and clarity. And so this actually is something that will help um, help you during this time, right? Routines. Uh, on top of the social connections and the and the and the deeper uh, connections with your community. Okay, so we got that. So build and repair relationships. You have no excuse now, right? Exactly what we're talking about. This goes back to a community. Uh, if you want an actual community, it's all going to be about deep relationships. So start building them. Start repairing them. If you're staying at home, um, you know, with family, uh, spend some time getting to know them, right? If there's been uh, past trauma, past things you need to heal, uh, address them. You know, talk to your talk to your loved ones, right? Um, you know, family gives us some of the most um, some of the the biggest healing opportunities. You know, because there's a lot of stuff that comes out of our families. Three, focus on the basics of health and wellness. Again, right, we're talking about health today. So we've got the global health crisis issues right now due to COVID-19. But now, because we're at home, we've got to look at sort of our own routines and look at the health and wellness of our, ourselves as individuals. We've got to learn to love ourselves. We've got to lo learn to love the people around us. And um, this time is a way for you to focus on that, right? To, to focus on uh, your, your health and wellness. So again, routines, shift it up, uh, change it make it healthier. There's so many free resources going out online right now um, to help you do that. And of course, remember, you are not alone. Yep, you are, you are truly not alone. Um, the next bit here, uh, because it has to do with health, um, I had a con conversation with a few people around just price transparency. 
uh, or just transparency in general when it comes to healthcare. And and the, the context for this was around uh, blockchain and Bitcoin, right? And, and I'll make the connection for you too, so you can understand. But how, price transparency, um, you can imagine, right? Right now, there's so many issues with um, people really not knowing uh, how much things cost, and so getting ripped off in a, in you know whether it's from black markets to just general pharma, and um, when I say pharma, pharmaceuticals, right? So let's have a look here. In his recent speech online, President Trump highlighted a proposed rule that hospitals make uh, make their prices public. It's time for hospitals to comply. Transparency will likely lead to lower prices and a reduction in healthcare spending, right? So the re the reason why this becomes important is because healthcare, especially in the United States. Um, it's, it, it really is all about the money. If you have more money, you'll get access to better healthcare. But something like like healthcare, you know, it makes you question: Does that work in a free market? Does it work? Should it be something that is centralized? Should it be something that's government led? Um, I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts. So you know, feel free to to share them uh, in the comments. But I think by having more transparency around um, public services in general, right? I think it would just allow us to be able to uh, see what's right and fair um, a little bit better. And so why this also uh, becomes important is because, yeah, when it comes to drugs, right, uh, you, hopefully you won't get as ripped off. And uh, the reason why I brought up the transparency bit and why blockchain um, becomes very interesting, so EHR data, Bitcoin, SD, so give me one second. thought I had this up already, but okay. So here, there's a, a blockchain called Bitcoin SV. Uh, please see my other episodes if, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but essentially, there's this company called EHR Data Incorporated um, who have partnered with a company called Enchain who currently have the highest number of, uh, or the most number of patents around blockchain uh, in the world, I believe. And um, you might not have heard about them because they're not a big name like, you know, Alibaba, IBM, any of those guys. But it's very wealth, uh, very worth knowing who they are because you'll probably hear more about them in the future. Now, they're looking to address the opioid crisis, right? Um, and what they want to do is provide more transparency as well uh, to healthcare records, right? And so that there is a way for people to be able to access reliable um, sources of truth. And um, why Bitcoin? So a proof-of-work public blockchain is the only technology that guarantees immutability of records. So if you are new to this space, immutability means um, unchangeable, right? Mutable, uh, immutable. Bitcoin incentive model enhances security of the blockchain, vital when working with healthcare data, right? So this means that uh, it, for, for the security side, it, and especially for healthcare data, you want to make sure that you're getting the right data. Now, there's a bit about making sure that doctors and nurses put in the correct data, right? That's a human problem. But once it's on a blockchain, then ideally you have a little bit more reliable source of truth when it comes to the data side. And then a global electronic healthcare record requires a single global blockchain to provide a portable EHR. So that means it makes it more transparent between groups, organizations, hospitals, etc., to be able to access that information uh, more easily. Right, so I'm sharing this with you just so you can see how it crosses between healthcare, blockchain, and then even communities. Right, and of course, you know, with transparency, there's a dark side to it. This article was shared back in 2017. Um, it was uh, done by McKinsey, and uh, it has more to do with just transparency in the business world. And uh, just to have a think about, there are sometimes a situation where transparency works. Sometimes where transparency might have an adverse effect. A lot of times we might think that transparency is great for everything, but you know if you're ever in a relationship, you know sometimes you don't want to be airing all of your dirty laundry uh, if you have dirty laundry, right? Or all of your problems out into the world, right? Um, so there is uh, th there is obviously a yin and yang element, you know, which I always refer to Pareto principle: maybe eighty percent transparency, twenty percent not transparent. Um, but you know, I, I've seen this in organizations as well. Um, you know, to be able to go extreme exp uh, transparent, it, it's an extremism. So, you know, is that better? Uh, so, yeah, just showing here. So this article, The Dark Side of Transparency. I'll include that in the, um, in the show notes. Okay. So, yeah, again, and just as I guess, you know, wrap us up, uh, this particular video from Bill Gates uh, during his TED Talk was, you know, it's been viewed quite, quite a few times. Uh, and even more so now during the uh, pandemic, 
that we're currently experiencing, and for, for good reason, right? Because essentially Bill Gates was talking about a while back that we the world is not ready for a pandemic. And I think what's been happening in the world right now has shown that, especially in the West, which is really fascinating, right? If we think about the West has been our shining light for quite some time now, right? And, you know, if you look throughout history, there's always been sort of a shift of powers, you know, from east to west to east to west. And my personal opinion is that, you know, there is going to be a shift again to the east because we've seen how a lot of Asian countries have probably handled this crisis a lot better than um, the west. And that's not to say that the west is doomed. It's just these are cycles, you know, and it's one of the reasons why I've been so fascinated by things that are happening in the East and sort of the combination of Western influence too in the East because there's a lot that is good about the West when it comes to individualism. Uh, you know, the extreme of community, right, is communism, right? And uh, we, we, we don't want that as well. But at the, in the same breath, in a society that becomes too individualistic, we can see how we were just talking about isolationism, uh, loneliness. Uh, you know, people have become so individualistic that they have had to learn how to do community. You know, um, my my role as well in the past uh, as a profession was a community manager. I remember my auntie told me one time, she's like, oh, so what do you do? Uh, what do you do, George? And uh, now, and she, and then I was like, oh, you know, I'm working as a enterprise community manager for a, a financial tech company. And she's like, community manager? I said, yeah, I'm actually teaching people and showing them how to actually build a community around their um, internal products or, you know, for their employees. I was like, wow, you have to teach that. And I was like, yeah, I know it's a bit weird because in the islands, right, community just happens naturally, right? That's a, it's a given. And um, in the West, we've had to professionalize it. You know, we've had to put fancy studies, strategies, tactics, you know, content around how to build communities because we've kind of lost um, our way when it comes to that. And so with that, you know, I just uh, would love for you guys to, you know, share your comments below about sort of um, anything to do with healthcare, transparency in the blockchain, um, and even communities and support networks. You know, what are your thoughts on these areas right now during COVID-19? Um, do you think that it's, uh, it's a good thing that we look at reimagining, right? If we look back to that first article, if we look at reimagining healthcare um, out in a, in a post-pandemic world, right? And uh, with that, as always... Remember, through patience and persistence, it will come. The eyes may be able to see, but without a heart, you cannot fail.